down. And then here we've got this, this first line of the cross right here. And does that kind of look like that Bible up there? You see? It's a little blocked. Just like that, makes sense? Just like that, guys. So that's the Bible. And then we've got right here in this middle piece right here, we have the baptismal font, which is sitting right there on top of the pulpit. Can you see it? That's old. But if you let the line come down, so there's the baptismal font. If you let it come down like this, it looks like a cup, like a chalice that we use in communion. So that's that line. And then we have the bottom one right here. And that looks kind of like the pulpit. So that stands for the pulpit. And then we've got plain here, which stands for the Holy Spirit that lives in our hearts. So, all together, the cross, and of course the whole thing is a cross, which is the sign of our faith. Right? So it reminds us that we, that we rely on the Holy Spirit and on the scriptures and the preaching of the scriptures and on communion and baptism. And that's the basis of our faith. So, that's pretty cool. Thank you, Leona. Let's hold hands and say a prayer. And I'll say some words, and you all can say them out. And the congregation can join in. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for giving us the Bible.
book of 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then. And I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And the king of Israel read the letter and tore his clothes and said, Am I God? Give life or death, that this man sends word to me to cure men of leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot to cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures for us. The psalm that we will read together is Psalm 66. Verses 1 to 12. Uh, as usual, I will read this section, which is not bolded. And if you please 
On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them bound to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Things are not going well for Naaman. First of all, he's come down with leprosy. We're not sure exactly what kind of skin disease that is, but whatever we call it nowadays, uh, we can trust that it is unpleasant and painful and kind of gross. Enough to put a damper on anyone's week. And on top of that, no one in his own country seems to be able to help him. Considering the way society worked in the ancient world, he must have been pretty desperate if he was willing to listen to his wife's slave. But he did, and she told him that she knew someone who could help him, a prophet in her home country of Samaria. And the king sent him off in style to be healed. Unfortunately for Naaman, doing what a young female slave tells him to do is not going to be the least of his indignities on this journey. Going to see a mysterious prophet a long way from home might seem like the beginning of a good adventure novel. But as he's about to find out, the reality had a habit of being a little disappointing. About nine years ago, I was sitting in church with a three-year-old on my lap. Her name was Emily, and we were fast friends for the mysterious reasons that a toddler becomes friends with somebody, just because I was around, I think. But I wasn't complaining. I loved her back. And she and her parents had sat in the same queue I was in, and she crawled across to me, and so I was feeling very grown up with this three-year-old in my lap, and I was doing the things you do, right? Uh, pointing the words in the bulletin and uh, hauling her up so that she could stand on the pew beside me when we got up to sing, and uh, I unwrapped her candy behind my back when it came to the bulletin time for the sermon. And after the sermon, we were baptizing a baby. And as the tiny, tiny baby, and his parents and his grandparents gathered around the font. We had one of the ones that stand on the floor down here, and everybody came up and stood around it with the pastor. I hauled Emily up just a little bit more upright in my lap so she could see, and I said, watch, this is really important. They're going to baptize that baby. And she believed me. And she craned all the way up as far as she could. And she said, what is it? What's happening? Toddlers can't whisper, but they think they can. <laughs> Just watch, I told her. And she did. She watched everything that was happening. And when it was over, she said, that was boring. Disappointing your favorite three year old? <laughs> Ouch. It was easy for me, even at that point in my life, someone who was utterly enamored with the church and the things the church does, to sing the praises of baptism and to make grand pronouncements to Emily about how important it was. But for Emily, the pastor said stuff, the people said stuff, the baby got some water on its head and cried. Kind of weird, but adults do weird things all the time. Not too impressive to the discerning eye of this toddler. I don't want to insult Naaman, the great man that he was, by comparing him to a three-year-old. 
still have something that he doesn't, which defeats the point of conquering, doesn't it? And when he finally arrives at the palace and sees the king, it doesn't go very well. Poor guy. The first and last time he gets to talk to someone powerful in his story. And the guy can't help him. He gets mad about being asked. Then the king shuts him off to some random man who isn't even important enough to live the court. And even so, won't come out and see him. And to add insults to really the growing heap of insult, he sends his servant to go tell him to take a bath. All that effort, all that swallowing of his pride, just to be told by a servant to take a bath. Of course Naaman is insulted. Of course he's mad. I mean, I would be. Take a bath to a man with a skin disease? It's ignorant and mean-spirited, and on top of that, it's ridiculous. Because everybody knows that taking a bath in the river isn't going to cure leprosy any more than a good hot shower is going to cure cancer. If it's a question of bathing, there are bigger, cleaner, more powerful rivers at home. If that's all the prophet has to tell him, he might have saved himself a lot of trouble and stayed there. David keeps turning to powerful solutions. It's common sense. But you know, I don't think God has a lack of common sense. If he does, he doesn't seem to pay much attention to it. From a common sense perspective, my friend Emily was right about baptism. On the face of it, there's nothing particularly exciting about baptism. It's not even as impressive as the Jordan River that Naaman despised, at least for us, it's acquired a kind of mystique that makes up for its physical appearance. Most of us were not baptized in the River Jordan, or in any river at all. Most of us were not baptized in grand churches by famous or notoriously holy people. Most of us were baptized by an average pastor in a not terribly impressive sanctuary out of a metal bowl, maybe in a wooden stand that someone filled up a few minutes before the worship service. I know someone who was baptized in the even less impressive blow-up kiddie pool that they stuck in the back of the worship service. If you come to be baptized or to have your child baptized with the promises of scripture ringing in your ears, that in these waters we die with Christ and are raised with them. That here we find forgiveness of sins. That here we are initiated into the whole body of believers, the living and the dead. Honestly, you might really find feel a little bit let down. The church has nothing on the Freemasons or on your local fraternity when it comes to initiation rituals. Naaman is a man of common sense, and he is a dog. Being dismissed to bathe in a dirty river is the last straw. If he hadn't stopped to listen one more time to his servants before he stormed back home in a huff, this would be a mildly infuriating story with no happy ending, and no one would think it worth preserving. But bless him, he does listen to his servants, and bless the servants too, because listening or just talking to your boss when he's in that kind of mood is asking for grief. If it were hard, you'd have done it. You've already proved that. You've gone on a 300 mile journey while very, very sick. But this is easy. What's the harm? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you might as well try it. The problem, of course, is that there's no dignity in trying it. If he'd been allowed to ride up to the king's palace in state and been received in honor, if the prophet had arrived looking elderly and powerful and mysterious, if he had lit candles and chanted strange words and drawn symbols in the air and waved his staff and Naaman had been restored to health, that would be one thing. 
Surely that would be a much better way to treat the honored and well-beloved commander of Aram's armies. But being sent off, sight unseen, to take a bath in a river might be easier, but it's a lot less gratifying. It's a lot less dignified. But if God doesn't much like common sense, he's got even less time for dignity. Or at least that kind of dignity. The kind of dignity of the oppressive and powerful. God delights, apparently, in honoring the unimpressive and the weak. Because Naaman took the advice of his wife's slave and obeyed the command of Elijah's servant and went to that glorified creek that was so dwarfed by the rivers in his own country. Well, that little dirty creek washed off Naaman's leprosy and left his skin smooth and healthy again. That muddy little creek, all appearances aside, all common sense aside, was what God chose to use to heal Naaman. He could have used an impressive ritual and powerful words, but he didn't. Apparently, God is pleased to use the pitiful and somewhat disappointing things of the world to show the foolishness of the strong things. <coughs> despite its littleness and ordinariness, despite the crying baby in the tap water, despite the fact that it might be disappointing to toddlers or even grown-ups who hope to do heroic things for God's sake. God delights in using baptism to bring his kingdom to earth. Like God used the dirty waters of the Jordan to cleanse Naaman's leprosy, God uses tap water in an ordinary church to clean up the mess that human beings have made of themselves. Water can't wash off leprosy, and it can't wash off evil. But by God's will and joyful disregard for common sense, this water does. By God's will, this tap water washes away sin and heals death. It scrubs away every speck of alienation from God and God's community. If it were harder, if it were more impressive, we might honor it more. But God has made it easy. God tells us to go and wash and be clean. He tells us to eat and drink and be healed. Tap water, little bits of bread, little sips of grape juice like you might give to children. Unimpressive little gatherings of God's people on earth, led by a pastor who's probably not noticeably gifted, worshiping a Lord who came in obscurity and humility. God has chosen these things to mediate his grace to us. If they were more impressive, more difficult, maybe the world would take more note. But God's love made them simple made them accessible, even to the weakest and smallest and youngest of us. So praise God for these simple and unimpressive things through which he has chosen to purify and heal the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
of your goodness and providence and redemption. Restore this broken world. Calm our fear and our anger, being the answer to all our searching and the question that doubts our answers. God of mercy and compassion, we pray this day that where there is illness, you would bring wholeness. Where there is grief, bring comfort. Where there is loneliness, bring companionship. Where there is weariness, bring rest. Where there is anxiety, bring calm. Where there is regret, bring forgiveness. Where there is hunger, bring sustenance. Where there is addiction, bring freedom. Where there is homelessness, bring shelter. Where there is estrangement, 